Good morning from NATO headquarters in Brussels. I'm here with my colleague uh, James Sapathurai. Uh, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy. And he's also the NATO Secretary General a Special Representative for the Caucasus and Central Asia. Good morning, James. I'm pleased to host this first joint webinar with our colleagues from the EU on strengthening Georgia's resilience against disinformation and what is the role for the European Union and for NATO. I welcome our colleagues from the European External Action Service, Oliver Rentschler. He's the Director for Interinstitutional Relations, Policy Coordination and Public Diplomacy at the EEAS. Good morning. We have also three colleagues and friends joining from Georgia. Good morning to Irakli Shikovani, the spokesperson of the Georgian Prime Minister. Morning. Tamar Kinshurasvili, Executive Director of MDF, Myth Detector, a Media Development Foundation. And Eto Buriashili, a research associate from the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab in Tbilisi. Good morning. The aim of today's webinar is to discuss how this information is affecting Georgia in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and what more we can do together to help Georgia society and Georgia's institutions increase resilience. Our cooperation is not new because both NATO and the European Union have been working closely for many years with Georgia to increase our common understanding of this information and also to support each other in our efforts to respond. But what is new for all of us is the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic, an unprecedented global crisis, has been exploited by state and non-state actors to spread this information, to take this information to a new level. And the challenge has become so serious during this health crisis that is being discussed at the highest political level in NATO and in the European Union. It has moved to the top of the political agenda of our governments and organizations, and rightly so. The increase of disinformation has also led our nations and intergovernmental institutions to work more closely together, to compare analysis, to look for common answers, and to learn from each other. So today's joint EU-NATO webinar is a reflection of that. It is an example of our redoubled efforts to tackle together a challenge that undermines the values of our institutions and also our free and our democratic societies. And our cooperation is even more important, taking into account that hostile narratives are targeting international cooperation, solidarity, and multilateral institutions. We have intensified our collaboration, not only between institutions, but also by joining forces with representatives of our civil society to work together, especially to identify, to monitor, and to expose this information. And this is why we have two NGOs with us today. Because disinformation activities are questioning our response to the crisis, they are trying to create confusion and also to undermine our unity. In an attempt also to shape for our publics the post-crisis environment. An interesting point is that experts have detected a significant convergence between Chinese and Russian anti-Western propaganda narratives. And we see this as something new. Our response, the NATO response to this information has been first, proactive, factual, and transparent communications, explaining to our publics what we are doing. And second, working more closely with our partners to help us build greater resilience. And this is where Georgia comes in for this first joint NATO-EU webinar, online public diplomacy engagements against the backdrop of information we have chosen to address the concerns of our Georgian friends. Because this demonstrates, and this demonstrates actually the priority given to Georgia by both organizations, by NATO and by the European Union. We are aware of the threats and the challenges that Georgia faces in the information space. There are many, for many years, Georgia has been heavily targeted by propaganda, by a war of words, as part of the destabilization efforts emanating from Russia. And with our support, we do hope that Georgia will, be, will continue to increase its, its resilience, and also especially in this period running into the elections. Mm -hmm. 
So on this note, let me now give the floor to Oliver Rentschler, our first speaker, and then James will follow. And we will move after that to our Georgian panelists. I would like to tell you that we only have five, 50 minutes, not five, 50 minutes, <laughs> because our Secretary General is meeting with the US Secretary of Defense, Esper. So we need to, uh, to cut this to basically, I mean, by 10 minutes. So Oliver, we are moving now to the other uh, part of Brussels. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. So give us your perspective, Oliver. Good morning to everyone and thank you um, for your uh, setting the scene so uh, eloquently and brilliantly. Uh, makes it easier for me also to be a bit shorter because on many of the analytical side of things we obviously uh, are on the same uh, page. Uh, I am very happy and um, pleased that we have this uh, webinar uh, and that uh, we have uh, not only EU and NATO but also Georgian government, Georgian civil society among us. It's the first time ever. But you have uh, exactly explained why it is so timely to have it uh, now. Uh, I mean, COVID-19 is not only a pandemic, but the World Health Organization has, has adopted a, an infodemic as well. And you have uh, described uh, brilliantly what, uh, what that entails. Um, we, as External Action Service of uh, the European Union, have over the past weeks uh, published four reports uh, analyzing a bit the um, events around COVID-19 and, and disinformation and uh, the documentation is, is uh, fairly clear. I mean, uh, external actors, notably uh, pro-Kremlin sources, but you've also uh, mentioned uh, a new actor uh, on the stage, so to speak, have been active uh, spreading this information, amplifying existing conspiracy theories, linking the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to biological warfare, 5G technology, uh, fueling anti-vaccination uh, sentiments and so on. So it's very clear vigilance uh, and cooperation of the like-minded is, uh, is more important than ever and uh, Georgia, NATO and EU are like-minded uh, in this and uh, that's exactly what today's event is also showcasing. Uh, acting together on this uh, can uh, only make us all uh, stronger. In fact, one of the uh, most prominent disinformation narratives that was used uh, in the early weeks in particular was about lack of European solidarity, about uh, you know systemic superiority of the let's say authoritarian regimes over the liberal and rule-based uh, ones. Uh, our high representative has, has stopped it uh, at one point, uh, a battle of the narratives where this information was indeed actively used. Well, here are the facts. Uh, the EU and Team Europe have uh, mobilized 400 million uh, euro of support to assist uh, Georgia in this unprecedented crisis, uh, including 250 million uh, in grants and 150 in loans plus access to, to regional funding. Uh, and that's one of the highest uh, levels of assistance per capita anywhere uh, in the world. Assistance that's directed towards uh, macroeconomic stability, business recovery, healthcare. So it's clear the EU um, remained uh, Georgia's or remains uh, a reliable partner, particularly in this time of crisis. And together we have worked to demonstrate uh, solidarity uh, and uh, what uh, what that can achieve in such uh, times. And in these testing times, we remain as committed uh, as ever to support a resilient, a prosperous, and independent Georgia uh, in uh, within its internationally recognized borders, being fully aware that Georgia's security is paramount for a secure Caucasus and implicitly, obviously, also a secure European Union. And all these messages have also been passed um, and confirmed uh, these commitments confirmed last week uh, at the very highest level uh, the leaders of the european union and the eastern partner uh, countries have uh, via uh, btc obviously convened and had a successful meeting and i think that when we talk about this information remains the very first order we need to do the right thing um, show the successful policies and then also communicate uh, about them because proactive uh, communication and you've also mentioned that is the first um, order, so to speak. And we are doing a lot to uh, up our uh, game, to raise our game, uh, using diverse communication mix to promote uh, the benefits, for example, of the association agreement and its free trade area um, and the reforms uh, that need to be delivered in order to implement it. And our delegation does uh, an excellent work in this, by the way, also um, then having an impact. Uh, we had recent polls showing 69% uh, of support or trust rather in the EU uh, in, uh, in Georgia. Um, but we need to go beyond. And I think proactive communication, doing the right thing, uh, making it clear 
uh, is is one thing. But uh, unfortunately, we need to. We can't stop there. We can never be complacent with this kind of, uh, of challenge. Uh, so we have also stepped up our strategic communication, analytical, uh, and response capacities, uh, particularly for the Eastern Partnership region and and Georgia. Um, we have uh, just recently published. Um, upon a tasking from the leaders of the European Union, together with the, uh, the Commission, a joint communication on COVID-19 related uh, disinformation. And in that document, as in our earlier action plan, there's a specific reference uh, to the EU's neighborhoods. Because quite simply, we are in this uh, together. Um, we have a database on our EU versus disinfo uh, website, which uh, includes many examples of disinformation activities, uh, including ones that have been trending in Georgia amidst the COVID-19. I'm not going into the details now, but it's of course publicly available and worth a visit. And we have also quite actively during the pandemic worked uh, with uh, Georgia and the partners in the Eastern uh, neighborhood, uh, for example, organizing online training, interactive online training for our young European ambassadors on countering this information with more than 120 participants. Uh, we have expanded our audiences with more entertaining and locally relevant content in Georgian language. Uh, awareness raising, again, is, is a key element in all this. Um, video on narratives, for example, targeting the Luga laboratory. Uh, and and uh, I could go into more details, but I think we're pressed for time. You show, you see that we are active, we are concrete. Uh, however, um, we also uh, are fully aware that a resilient information space can only be achieved uh, by enabling and protecting the pluralist and non-partisan media sector and safeguarding uh, fundamental uh, rights, uh, such as, of course, freedom of expression and the right of access to public uh, information. And we will also continue to support this including through a soon-to-be-launched multi-annual program for media development. Um, before concluding, still also highlighting uh, two or three other elements that I think are important in this context. One is the uh, crucial role of local fact-checking organizations and the excellent work already done in order to safeguard uh, democratic, open, uh, pluralist information space. So it's also in that uh, respect very important that we have brought, let's say, representation from uh, from Georgia. Um, we have also, um, a, we are aware of the fact that all these efforts can only have a, a full impact if uh, credible, trusted Georgian voices uh, from the public and the private sector uh, uh, do their part in promoting these transformative reforms and the shared values. Uh, and as we also uh, always say in the EU, it's not only a whole of government, but a whole of society uh, task and, and challenge. The same is obviously true for, for Georgia, uh, whose authorities and civil societies uh, so civil society share a responsibility here. Finally, um, I want to also use this opportunity to highlight uh, the fact that I'm very pleased that uh, EU and NATO are cooperating in this because apart from being beneficial to um, to Georgia when we together w work together to protect uh, the integrity of its information space. It also has benefits for EU NATO cooperation uh, as such. So it, to, to me, it looks really like a perfect win-win. Uh, and I'm therefore also confident that we will uh, see more of this, that uh, this webinar will be followed by regular practical exchanges uh, between our experts uh, in this very same format, EU NATO uh, Georgia, uh, focused mainly on shared situational awareness, complementary response action. Complementary is a word that we like a lot also in EU NATO, uh, but it can work perfectly well here. And the network of EU NATO uh, information centers uh, is uh, a unique asset in, in the region and we should uh, and can uh, use it more uh, at regional level involving also local actors and the local community. So in that perspective, I'm um, looking forward to seeing more of you and one day hopefully and possibly also in uh, person again. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Oliver. We are really on the same page. So now over to James for the NATO perspective. Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, this is the first ever uh, such uh, formula, so thanks for organizing it. Uh, and I also will try to be a little bit more brief uh, than normal because time is short. I would say there's maybe four things we need to consider. One is we have to recognize the problem, and I think we all are here recognizing the problem. But I think we also need to be honest and recognize that there's some success in these dis in disinformation efforts by Russia and separately, but to a certain extent, in a coordinated way by China. So we really need to put some urgency into this. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're uh, 
you're talking about it, but we can see across the Western world, we can see in the Caucasus in Georgia as well, that some of this disinformation, some of these narratives, if they don't necessarily convince, they create doubt. Uh, and that's part of the strategy uh, of these actors. So just to be brief, I think we, also, we need to have some urgency about this. There is success in the disinformation campaign. The second thing I would say is the strongest response, and this is something you have always said and I said in previous life as well, is not just in better communications, but in actually doing the things that we can then show. In other words, allies need to support each other. NATO and the EU need to work together. The EU should be as effective as NATO has to be effective, and we have to help our partners. So there have to be concrete examples of support that we can then show. So it's not just clever messaging. Uh, and uh, the substance, I think, is actually there. Uh, we have done a lot together. Uh, and let me mention, for example, that coming straight to Georgia, Georgia took advantage of or, or uh, engaged with our Euro-Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center. It's a long name, but it's basically the body here at NATO that takes requests from allies, but also from close partners for support and communicates that to the entire community of countries, allies and partners, at which NATO is the center. And then we coordinate support. So Georgia did make a request in April to uh, NATO and through NATO to other partners. Since then, uh, Poland, the US, the UK, Slovakia, Lithuania, Estonia, Bulgaria, and Poland have all provided support uh, to Georgia. So this is like a concrete list of countries demonstrating that this cooperation works. And we have to make sure we maximize uh, the visibility of that. I would also mention, exactly as Oliver said, that NATO and the EU are working together, and we have to show that as well. Uh, so that's the second part, do, act. Mm -hmm. uh, the third part is building resilience. Uh, and you both mentioned it, you uh, and Oliver. We have been working closely together with Georgia to help Georgia build resilience. Uh, we have the umbrella of the substantial NATO Georgia package. Uh, Georgia is very alert to this, has been alert for many years. Unfortunately for Georgia, Georgia has often been at the forefront of receiving the latest new uh, problem. Uh, and uh, in the case of disinformation, hybrid attacks, Georgia is more experienced than we are. And <laughs> I, I don't wish that on anyone, but happily Georgia has shared this experience, but also looked to us for cooperation. So under the substantial NATO Georgia package, we've had a, a line of work on strategic communications. Uh, the U United Kingdom has helped to lead this uh, for many years and we're now upgrading that package and it's very timely. We have been focusing on helping the Ministry of Defense set up its strategic communications capabilities. We have also connected Georgia closely with the Center of Excellence for Strategic Communications in Riga, which is a great resource which monitors the activities of automated bots spreading disinformation. It studies the development of deepfakes, uh, the legal framework for malicious social media activities, and importantly for Georgia in the run-up to elections, mitigation efforts to counter the man manipulation of elections. Georgia knows exactly what we're talking about. We all see it now in our countries. Uh, we are looking to branch out beyond the Ministry of Defense uh, because exactly as, as Oliver said, resilience is a whole of government and a whole of society uh, effort. And the establishment of a National Security Council in Georgia helps to have a coordinated approach and that has to include a coherent strategy when it comes to disinformation across all branches of government so that they're coordinated, they're focused, they know what the aims are. Uh, Georgia has a communication strategy on Georgia's EU and NATO membership that I think is up to this year, so it may need to be um, revised. Uh, Georgia is receiving a lot of support from the EU and we're working together with the EU uh, to support them as well. Uh, then. I would just, to be very brief, think about what more we need to do going forward. 
Uh, I would encourage Georgia to share its best practices with us, uh, and we will set a platform for that. We already do it, but we'll continue to do it. I think we need to continue these kinds of expert-to-expert -expert engagements. So this webinar is a great start, but I wouldn't stop uh, here. Uh, and I think we need to strengthen the focus in our bilateral cooperation on resilience so that we can uh, help build Georgia's ability to resist this, and we have systems in place to do that. I would conclude, however, by, by noting what Oliver said, uh, and that is it's really up to Georgia, not up to NATO, and not even up to our cooperation. It is up to Georgia to enable and protect pluralism and nonpartisan nonpartisanship in the media. And that means allowing the people to speak and also having a media environment that is pluralistic and nonpartisan. That is crucial so that people have faith in institutions and so that people aren't vulnerable to disinformation. Even distrust in institutions is already a win for those who want disinformation because what they say is your government can't handle it, the EU can't handle it, NATO is not succeeding, uh, and they don't necessarily say trust us. The Chinese do say trust us. Yes. Uh, the Russians say don't trust yourselves, uh, and you don't know what's true. And maybe this virus is uh, created in a lab. Maybe it's created in a lab in Georgia. That's one of the stories, or at least that lab is, is seen as a... Um, as a target for Russian disinformation. I, I just saw a poll by a very respectable uh, polling company in the United States saying that a very high percentage of people believe that a vaccine, if it comes, will be used by Bill Gates to inject nanobots or tracking technology into their bodies. And so they're afraid of it. I mean, these are big numbers of people. So we really need to fight back. We need to have institutions that are trusted so we will support Georgia in doing that, but they need a pluralist uh, media environment. And reform leads to strong institutions. It makes you resistant to disinformation. Good. Thank you very much. So Oliver and James have put the important questions on the table. So now we are moving to our Georgian friends. And uh, James raised one point that I would like to, to ask our three Georgian friends. As you were saying, James, uh, the Russians have been saying that uh, basically COVID-19 was uh, you know, made in a US lab uh, in Georgia and uh, other places. Mm. So could you tell us how you have been dealing with such claims, for example? Iraqli, uh, we move now to you. What are the Georgian institutions learning from the COVID-19 crisis in terms of disinformation? And you may also want to touch upon what James said about strong and resilient Georgian institutions. Iraqli, up to you. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the organization of this kind of an, a webinar. And I want to reiterate our readiness to participate in further run and develop this platform for, for further cooperation. And, uh, uh, also thank participants for being here from the beginning. I want to apologize that I couldn't have confirmed my presence here because uh, today Prime Minister, as we speak, is making his annual address to the parliament uh, about uh, uh, on the state of the union of the country. So after this meeting is done, I'll be joining him there. Well, um, threatening Georgia's resilience and building capacity to fight against disinformation is a challenge that we deal on a daily basis. Uh, and this information virus, so to speak, is uh, uh, something that is together with us every day. And it has attached itself to the, such an important case, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. I will discuss this in a greater detail later on, but I want to elaborate and uh, give you some info of what's, where we stand. The threatening Georgia's resilience and building capacity to fight against the information is something that we cannot do alone. This is something that we think that should be done together with our uh, allies through sharing knowledge, experience, and engaging in proactive coordination. And of course, conducting the fact-based communication and of course, sharing the instruments as we have just mentioned, the uh, speakers have mentioned uh, previously. This information affects all countries equally. Uh, and Georgia is on the forefront of, of it. And Mutual alerting, alerting and as well as development of stronger cooperation and joint response to threats is a great benefit for us and I think for our allies too. 
Another direction to be explored in strengthening the research aspect is through center of excellence, as you have said, the namely conducting country specific research and assessment of the information uh, environment in the country, particular, in particular in Georgia, also the disinformation methodology and in-depth target analysis. In cooperation and in partnership with the European Union and NATO, uh, Georgia has made a great progress in the area of strategic communication, and we are very much appreciating that this has been noted by our, by our partners and allies, but we do know we are far from being perfect and we need to engage even more to solidify our communication system. And, uh, but at this moment, we can say that we have threatened our institutional capacity, accumulated some expertise, which is very unique in its nature, improved communication policy. Of course, uh, we have uh, far away from the starting point in terms of implementation. We highly value EU-funded association agreement implementation facility project that has been assisting the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, to draft a new EU and NATO communication strategy for upcoming years. And this is something that is very important and we attribute a great deal of attention to that. The EU has been key actor in providing technical and financial support to Georgia in modernizing our media monitoring capabilities. Together with EEAS's Joint Research Center, we are implementing a two-year project where we are planning to train Georgian government of, of employees, officials, to operate with the European media monitoring platform. Um, further, the NATO Georgia package, the SNGP, has been very instrumental for the government of Georgia to develop stratum capabilities. And as it's been mentioned, the UK is a lead nation here. And in particular, I want to acknowledge the achievements that we have within the Ministry of Defense and the armed forces. And it's the results are self-evident and vivid. Additionally, uh, I have to mention that with the United States uh, support uh, and together with their local partner, which is Georgian Center for Strategy and Development and the UK government experts, we produced the coordination document of the Stratcom Department of the Administration of the Government of Georgia. And this will give us an operational framework for strategic communications that will be managed on the highest level. It uh, will also help us to institutionalize strategic communications with the government uh, furthermore, we're in the process of creating communication strategy of the government, which will be the unique in its nature and the first one, uh, which is in a research phase. And we are conducting very really thorough research in, uh, in cooperation with our uh, partners uh, to ensure that this is something that's going to answer the challenges that we have at hand. And of course, we'll have an in-depth analysis of the audience and the uh, informational environment in our country. And we think that's going to be something that will help us uh, to rapidly detect uh, counter uh, detect fake news and the disinformation campaigns, and of course, act uh, accordingly. Um, as you know, the uh, what, what are the main challenges? And I'll focus on it for just a few. As you know, the European and Euro Atlantic integration is a top priority of Georgia's foreign and security policy, which is now guaranteed by our constitution. And Recent polls have shown that the Georgian people are enormously supporting and more than 70% are for this uh, uh, integration. And this is something that comes with its own set, set of costs, which is more, in most cases are well organized and orchestrated disinformation campaigns waged by external actors, but are sometimes supported by the internal actors with uh, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, but it, it, it is there. In order to institutionally tackle such threats, the government of Georgia has been carrying out coordinated strategic communication measures on a daily basis. Just for example, as you know, Georgia recently came under the GRU attack, which has uh, compromised and uh, shut down the government websites, uh, the media websites, also the privately owned websites. And I have to note that from very beginning, there has been a big debate in country and beyond it, that this was something done by the government and that was uh, directed to uh, compromise the government uh, itself. But together with our allies, together with our friends and partner countries, we have been able to identify the source of the attack. And of course, to make sure that the wider public and the international community has been aware where this actually was coming. But still, yet again, we had a period of time where external and internal actors have been clearly blaming the government itself for orchestrating such kind of a cyber attack, which was damaging at some point. This type of destructive and illegal actions represent a serious challenge, particularly in the context of the upcoming elections in Georgia. As you know, we in 20, uh, 
in October we are be we will be having general elections, and this is something that we will be paying a lot of attention to make sure that we avoid. Uh, the uh, such kind of challenges, but it's going to be very demanding and it's going to be very uh, requiring resources and the time from the government, but we are ready for that. In this regard, I would like to cite another example of the latest disinformation where we develop, developed against the Georgia. As I mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning in my remarks, the COVID-19 has uh, tested the informational resilience of many countries, including in Georgia. In the wake of the crisis, Russia made... Uh, Russian media outlets uh, have uh, made increased uh, their disinformation campaigns uh, on con with the content of about COVID-19. And this is something that has been widely uh, agreed upon. On uh, uh, one of the primary targets of adversarial narratives has been the Luger Laboratory. Over the, year, over the years, this lab has been a target of multiple unfounded allegations and disinformation. However, lately the institution has been under heavy disinformation fire attempting to undermine and question the role to protect Georgia from biological or other health threats. These have been senseless implications connecting the spread of the virus to the lab itself. And you have, um, our previous speakers have mentioned about that previously. The main narrative of the disinformation about the COVID-19 was that the Georgian government does not have the capabilities to deal with the virus. For example, one set of disinformation spread the Georgia did not have skilled medical personnel, enough beds, enough oxygen tanks, and so on. And this is something that was actually following the pattern, the paradigm, the formula that the Russian propaganda is been, uh, pushing for. But unfortunately, this has been echoed widely within the media in Georgia on the one side, and also within the publicly active figures. And here I would like to uh, recall the comments of the European Commission Chief Spokesperson on foreign uh, policy and security policy, Mr. Peter Stano, when he was uh, discussing the uh, Russia's deliberate actions on COVID-19, he said that, and uh, I want to quote it, every responsible social media or media user should be aware of this, that there is a lot of misinformation circulating around. Double check, triple check, go to a media you really trust and look at the sources. Unfortunately, in Georgia, this is not the case sometimes. We have to tackle every day this uh, issue and we have to counter it every day and yet again people have tried to compromise the statistics statistics that the government was providing that this government was kind of trying to cover up but clearly everybody now realizes that government has acted and government has made its best to counter the COVID 19 but still during this process the fight was not only the evidence spread of COVID 19 and mitigating its uh, threats, but also mitigating the threats that were coming from the disinformation campaigns. Our approach was not to panic and nor to alleviate the false information, but rather demonstrate to the public that we had the situation under the control by ensuring top level transparency, accountability by the government to present truthful and verifiable information. And this, as Mr. Rapporteur has said, we have acted and communicated uh, at simultaneously. We conducted daily briefings. Personally, I was engaged in these meetings, making sure that the public had a clear understanding of what the government was doing. Same was done with the, by the public officials. Same was done by the line ministries and the medical personnel. And of course, the prime minister himself to clearly give every and each decision, the description that we were making and the base, uh, what we were basing uh, these decisions in order to make sure that the public had a clear understanding and thus being less, uh, less uh, concerned. And in conclusion, this information in Georgia manifests itself in uh, various forms and messages attempting to do uh, to sow distrust, division and panic uh, in the society as well to discredit government institutions. These activities are meant to grow divisions in our society, foster despair, cripple trust in institutions, including undermining confidence in our country's foreign policy. Our, must, our response is resolute and we count in our response on our allies with our partners, with the European Union, with NATO, partner countries, strategic partners. We are ready to be even more vigorous and robust to fight against disinformation using the most modern technologies and the protocols that are available at hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tamar, you lead a media development foundation. What have been the main disinformation challenges for media 
in Georgia during the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak and share our experience. And thank you for our international partners for your support because we're closely cooperating with the EU Stratcom, providing information on local trends with US government, NATO office, and your support in terms of resilience building is crucial. Like in previous year, we found that the main target of the foreign countries, the Luger Lab, and the COVID-related disinformation has three dimensions. The first is uh, information influence operation of hostile countries. And the second one is economic interests of click by sides, but the damage done by both actors are the same. And conspiritual mindset, which is not unique in Georgia, as it was rightly mentioned, because people truly believe that Bill Gates has some plans to vaccinate and gain money from this crisis. But uh, what we observe also is uh, alarming trends to use this crisis this situation in order to interfere in editorial decision making. And in transitional countries, it's alarming. When we are speaking about resilience building and strengthening of institutions, the simple answer is commitment to liberal democracies and strengthening democratic institutions instead of attacking them or duplicating these institutions. Uh, we should strengthen our society in order to protect them from foreign malign influences and it's crucially head of the elections and Georgia is vulnerable to Russian disinformation, especially when we are lacking national cohesion and consolidation and society is polarized. But before coordinating our efforts and cooperation of state and non-state actors is essential in this uh, regard, we should agree on common understanding of the problem. Is this uh, information hostile, information influence activities of foreign country or we are uh, declaring as the enemies local media outlets, even with poor reporting skills, but there are some institutions in place to respond on this violation. Are these problems equal and should a uh, mayor of city to organize a program to debunk fake stories produced by critical media outlets? Are we fighting with Kremlin sponsored media outlets with clearly defined agenda and intention to harm societies? Or we see enemies in domestic institution, critical media outlets not controlled by government or civil society actors fulfilling their watchdog functions. These are essential issues we should define in advance and we as a watchdog organization cooperating with our international partners are ready to cooperate with local government and we are lacking this cooperation, unfortunately. Uh, opinion polls show that Georgians are acknowledging Russian propaganda as a key security threat for the country after Russian military presence here. But opinion polls also show that Russian disinformation and propaganda mostly is affiliated with Georgian language media outlets. And there is a rational behind this. Georgian media consumers are more skeptical toward Russian government sponsored media sources. Sputnik Georgia is less popular in Georgia rather than Georgian language media outlets delivering and conveying the same messages. Unfortunately, these Georgian media outlets with nationalistic agenda openly campaigning against our uh, EU Atlantic integration, calling US occupier 
and NATO blaming NATO in provoking 2008 work, they are untouchable. And there is no rapid response from the government against these media outlets. Only critical media outlets, and they are not immune to criticism, of course, are target of government stratcom in internal discourse, unfortunately. And this domestic political agenda prevails on foreign security threats, which is much serious problem. And uh, Russia are, is using the Western brands to demonize West, for instance, Fox News, CNN, Ru, and we, our investigation reveals that their IP addresses are located in St. Petersburg or somewhere else. We are somehow providing the media literacy program in order to build resilience among the young people, 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 information, and how to find the real intention of the source, because transparency of sources helps a lot to, to reveal what is their goal, uh, finally. I mean, the political agenda, economic interest, or other topics. And uh, how Russian propaganda works in Georgia, we observe the two-dimension approach, indirect propaganda through Georgian language media outlets, and direct Russian propaganda in minority regions because of uh, language barriers. These people are more dependent on Russian sources, and there is uh, no alternative channels providing the minority language programs understandable for these people. And this is essential ahead of elections because democracy is about making informed choices. And uh, it's in interest of Russia to create information chaos and to say that everybody is bad. Uh, as it was rightly mentioned, they are not saying that we are good, but they are undermining trust in Western institution in West saying that West is weak to protect Georgia from the threats they are creating artificially. And Russia propaganda mainly based on uh, five fears. The first one is a fear not to irritate Russia. And an ugly port construction, NATO integration is presented, these topics are presented as a potential to provoke Russia to intervene in Georgia. Unfortunately, pro-Russian political party campaigning against the NATO integration tries to shift focus from Russian security challenges to historical one while recalling that Turkey as an occupier and uh, making, uh, making them equal problem for Georgia in modern context, saying that if Russia is occupier, why not? Turkey and there is a no uh, proper response on these issues. What is the security challenge for this country? Russian sponsored media outlets, Russian interference in our domestic problems or media outlets with poor reporting skills and uh, poor quality reporting or even biased political agenda, which is part of pluralism in this in democracy. Thank you, Tamar. Thank Sorry you very for... much. We need to move now to Eto, who is a very experienced researcher. And uh, I would like to ask you, Eto, what, what new do you see or you have observed in the Georgian information space that we should focus on together? We don't have much time. Sorry, Eto. Yes, the floor is yours. It's my honor to be joining you today in this important conversation. Thanks, NATO and you for their efforts to help Georgia in building resilience. Um, as the four parliamentary elections approach, the political situation in Georgia has become increasingly polarized, which is fueled by domestic as well as foreign disinformation campaigns and information operations. Firstly, the Georgian far-right and anti-Western groups have become increasingly active on social media, where they spread anti-Western and pro-Russian disinformation and attempt to influence Georgian society. Second, Georgia has been targeted by the Kremlin information operations on Facebook, um, we, which are um, conducting coordinated inoffensive behavior, attempting to deceive internet users. Both campaigns attempt to influence Georgian public opinion on countries' Euro Atlantic aspirations. Um, a couple of latest trends during COVID-19 pandemic are the following. 
the anti-Western crushed an opposition political party, the Alliance of Patriots, for example, is conducting its own public opinion poll as alternatives to those conducted by Western democracy development organizations operating in Georgia, such as NDI and IRI. And the party claimed to investigate public attitudes towards Georgia's zero planning aspirations, which according to the latest polls, are increasingly favorable and at its highest in the country. And soon they might introduce the results showing how, for example, Georgia doesn't want any kind of your planning integration. And this topic might lead to more polarization in the country. Meanwhile, other far-right groups and pro-Russian groups are attempting to present themselves as a trusted source for news and analysis on Georgia and so distrust of the West and inside an anti-LGBT sentiment in country in an effort to push its uh, anti-Western political agenda. These activities are particularly concerning ahead of approaching parliamentary elections, during which several anti-Western parties will be competing for uh, the votes of Georgians. Um, the main goal of far-right and anti-Western groups for, for now is to weaken the support of EU and NATO in Georgian society, and in this way, undermine democratic processes and the free choice of Georgian people. Um, the central principle of democracy that people should be able to select for themselves the leaders that meet their political views the most is under challenge, threatening to undermine our hard won freedoms in Georgia. Uh, we've been observing uh, lots of disinformation narratives intended to discredit NATO and EU um, into fear of uh, escalation uh, of the uh, Russian Georgian conflict among Georgians. The narratives aim to discuss public support for this embrace of Western institutions and values, and thereby um, undermining the process of Georgia's European uh, integration. Um, in the recent months, and especially during the escalation of COVID-19 pandemic in the country, Georgia has seen a couple of states of takedowns uh, related to Kremlin, as well as domestic inauthentic networks. And these bad actors were looking to mislead others through influence operations and trying to leverage crisis to advance their goals. The remote networks were created before coronavirus pandemic, but people behind the campaign had opportunistically used coronavirus related posts to build an audience and drive people to their content, which was pushing for anti-Western political agenda. And one of the cases was related to the Kremlin network, whose activity was linked to individuals based in Russia the Donbass region of Ukraine, and two news outlets in Russia and next Crimea. The network posted to, in multiple languages beyond Russian, including Georgian, and this shows how much resources are put in language capacity to reach as large local population as possible. And in this political setting, the role of EU and NATO is crucial in Georgia. The closer cooperation and resilience with the two institutions will a clear message not only to Georgian society, but to the bad actors too, that the West, Georgia's friends and allies, they stand with Georgia. The country continues its way towards your planning family where it belongs. And that the priority of the country is to continue to advance in democracy and to protect freedom and the information space. So thank you very much, Eto. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions this time, so it will be the next, the next time we will go straight uh, to questions. What, what I would like to conclude is that we seem to be all more or less on the same page in the sense that this challenge is very serious, that there is a lot of work that we have to do. This information, as James was saying, is creating doubts in our society, is having an effect. And therefore, our biggest strength is to continue to work together to further strengthen the resilience of with trusted institutions and also with robust and resilient civil society. Because as Oliver said, uh, we are on this together. And as Iraqli said, we can do this, we cannot do this alone. One of the points that I'm taking away is the fact that we need a stronger collaboration between civil society and government institutions to find joint answers to the challenge of disinformation. And I would like to give one minute to James and one minute to Oliver. James, to conclude. 
Well, I think this has been a really excellent initiative. Um, I'd just like to mention, and just to blow our own horn, but also to be very practical, that the NATO office in Georgia has had a communications effort in Georgia uh, for many years, uh, but that we will take you know, the lessons that we're all learning, including from this webinar, but also in the nonstop discussions and analyses that we're having, uh, including with our EU friends, uh, and try to bring those to Georgia. But I mean, my final point is this is really a two-way street. We need to learn from Georgia as well. Uh, so let's do it together. Let's do it in the run-up to the elections, um, because it's very important that Georgians have confidence in the result. And we need to recognize that we are in uh, a contest. And so we need to roll up our sleeves and really fight. Mm -hmm. Oliver? No, thanks a lot to, to all. I think this has uh, been very, very useful to also show that uh, uh, what we, of course, also know, disinformation uh, activities, they are they're multifaceted, they are they're constantly evolving and therefore need our uh, constant vigilance also and cooperation, comparing notes, uh, analyzing together. Um, and uh, I think the um, hope that some may have had that uh, this COVID-19 and related disinformation uh, tears us apart or, or uh, let's say splits us. I mean, the exact contrary is, is happening as we can also see. I mean, we're basically working together with closing uh, ranks uh, and we will invest further in, in all the important avenues that we have uh, highlighted, uh, resilience being a key. Uh, awareness raising and so on and of course also uh, the commitment to, to reforms uh, in Georgia the uh, fact that it's a whole of society effort so I think um, the COVID-19 has not damaged the cause of European and Euro-Atlantic integration but rather our response to it has, has reinforced it and I think that is maybe a positive uh, thing in all, in all this Thanks. Oliver, I agree we will invest further NATO, the European Union together with Georgia because this effort is a two-way street. Thank you very much for your participation.